So good morning or good night, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to another interview of The Shield Dude on a Couch. I'm your host, Hector. And today I'm joined by Mac Bolehan. And he's a multi-instrumentalist. He plays the trumpet. And he's been around uh, for years now. He's played on albums for the 70s all the way up to now. But he also has his own music. And we're here all to talk about his latest album that came out on September 29th. And so this is the album. It's Mac Bolehan and the Hispanic Mechanics, Bite of the Street. So I have with me Mac. Mac, how are you today? Doing great. Great to be here, Hector. Thank you. Awesome. So yeah, uh, usually I talk a lot about, I, I, I interview a lot of like metal punk bands, uh, shoegaze bands. So this is something different for me. But uh, when they uh, when they sent me the promo and and I saw the people that you work with, I'm like, yeah, like you you work with a lot of people. So uh, Max, so uh, for people that don't know you or your music, tell us a little bit of your background and how you got into the music business. Wow, well that that really, I mean that would really go that would really go way back. I mean I started I started in the circus bands when I was uh, 12, 13, 13. And then, uh, and then uh, that was playing trumpet. And then after that, I was playing a lot of different bands, a lot of different bands, playing guitar, playing uh, keyboards, guitar, playing all the brass instruments, playing all kinds of different things, rock and roll, uh, everything, uh, jazz, uh, just about everything you could imagine, really, even even a little bit of bluegrass growing up. And then uh, then I went to Boston immediately after that. And I went to Berkeley School of Music and did the four years up there. And it's really interesting. The four years I was there, I played uh, at nights. I was playing in an area called the Combat Zone, which was all strip joints and uh, strip clubs and stuff. And the bands were just amazing bands there, just killer bands. I mean, every night sounded like a uh, a Jimmy Smith record or a Jimmy McGriff record, you know, depends on which players you were playing with and they piped the music right straight out into the street over two microphones and it was like just an amazing sound i mean you had to really pull it together fast to like play those hours also because you'd be playing from uh nine o'clock in the evening until four o'clock in the morning and then you get up the next day and you start everything all over at school and uh that was like quite an experience and of course then after that i left came to new york and uh, right away, started doing some recording. I went briefly on the road with some big bands. I went on the road with Buddy Rich's band. It was during the summer of 78, I think it was, because he had some great gigs at the time. Man. He had all festivals. And uh, so I did the whole summer with Buddy and uh, played really great festivals and stuff. We backed up uh, great artists on that, too. It was uh, Frank Sinatra, um, uh, let's see, Mel Torme, um Peggy Lee, and of course, Buddy himself. And then we did double bills, people like B.B. King, and it was like the Newport festivals and all the big festivals and things. So I came back to New York and then um, got the call to do the Blondie record, did that record. And of course, I was already playing with some of the downtown bands. Uh, I was James Chance and the Contortions, which originally before that was Teenage Jesus and the Jerks. That was Lydia Lunch. But all these things were happening all at the same time. And then I was playing <clears throat> at the same time. I met great trumpet player, Ray Maldonado, who got me on subbing for him and a couple of bands. And then he took me into Hector Laveau's band. And then I started playing with Hector from uh, 1979, late 79 to about 1983. Wow. So maybe... Uh, early very early 83 and then uh after that which point um i was i moved over to larry harlow's band which was later became larry harlow's latin legends and but all kinds of things were happening at the same time while i was doing that at the same time i was doing that i was doing all kinds of recording uh the downtown scene was happening the punk thing was happening the uh, avant-garde jazz thing was happening at places like Ten Palace. I was playing in some bands there. Uh, at the very end point, I was playing Ali's Alley with some people down there, Jackie Byard, some people like that. Uh, some really great things. 
And at the same time I was playing with the downtown scene, I was playing also on tons of disco records and, and, and R and B records right after that. So I kept all these things quiet from everybody because nobody wanted you to be in multiple genres then, you know, because you didn't, you didn't talk about that. Everybody wanted you to just be playing with them or playing their music. And so I was like around the clock, just like running here, running there, playing all kinds of music. And another one I forgot to mention too, was I was doing quite a bit on a reggae and soca scene too, which was all being recorded in Brooklyn at that time. Uh, by different producers. One of them was Charlie's Records. One of them was Straker. Uh, one of them was Bees. Um, there was another one. I can't remember all of them right now, but no, I course. mean, there was literally <laughs> at least 500 of those records I was on over a span of 12 years, as well as a lot of Latin recording, Richie Ray, Bobby Cruz, uh, Hector Laveau, of course, um, uh, uh, I'll find your All-Stars record, uh, a film thing, Last Fight, Jerry Masucci, I think uh, Ruben Blattis was in, I believe, and that, all, all kinds, of, just everything was going on all at once. And then I was also, at the same time all that was going on, I was pretty busy in the jingle scene, too, for about two years. And that's when you were cutting commercials like uh, uh, jeans commercials and car commercials, and they were even doing cigarette commercials then, you know, for the cigarette companies yeah. were doing cigarette commercials. You don't see them now. <laughs> yeah, you don't see those now, no, but it was a pretty crazy time. And I, I kept everything separated and kept doing everything as much as I possibly could. Of course, the jingle thing eventually sort of collapsed for me a bit because you had to be totally 100% present for them all the time. If you missed one call, then that was already two strikes against you. If you missed two calls, then you're off the list for a year. And that's just the way that worked. And, you know, the guys that stayed in that scene, they stayed in that scene. You almost hardly didn't ever hear of them anywhere else. They rarely played anywhere else. And they just uh, retired with like huge pensions of like 10,000 a month. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> you know, went into a world of complete obscurity, but, you know, they made a lot of money. They did really well, but they didn't do anything else. They didn't do any touring. They didn't do anything. The only thing I could say I didn't do a lot of at all was Broadway. And I had no desire to do Broadway, still have no desire to do it, unless I had my own show and had a featured thing or something like that, uh, which I did have one of those around 1984, I think it was. Uh, Galt McDermott wrote a thing called Human Comedy. And I had a part where I come out front in a costume and, you know, played about five different doubles, six different doubles, and had a solo out front. But I did avoid Broadway, and I didn't get any calls much for Broadway, and which was pretty much intentional. But other than that, did just about everything there was to do. No, you you had a very uh, prolific career and, and worked on many albums. When did you sleep, Mac, <laughs> back in the 70s and 80s? Because it seems like you were doing everything. Yeah, 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 I was doing uh, quite a bit, quite a bit. Quite a bit. I, the hours were, uh, the, the hours were really, really wild. I was, I was talking to somebody. Somebody heard me talking to an interviewer. Uh, they heard one of the interviews I did recently, and uh, they, they heard me saying that. Well, I was doing two and three records a day. I said, Nah, you weren't doing two or three records a day. I knew you then. You were doing four and five records a day, recordings a day. And I said, Well. Come to think about it, yeah, you're you're right. I was, and then I was going to gigs after that, and uh, yeah, there, there were many a times I wouldn't even go home. I would just uh, I'd sleep in the car, take a nap in the car for about an hour and a half, two hours, and get up and start it all, start everything all over again. You know, I'd go to the store and get myself a new T-shirt or something, or or a new shirt, and just start the day all over again like that. You know, it was like it really was. It was that crazy for a while. Mm -hmm. Plus, a lot of the bands then that I was in, they would have the bands now would have, you'd be lucky if they have one show, one gig a week. And bands in those days, uh, they'd have six or seven gigs in a week. Sometimes the really popular ones would have eight or nine in a week. And then if you yeah, worked no. in two or three different bands, you had to try to balance all that. 
So it really seems like you really got into Latin music and it's uh, a bit while working. Uh, we, we, you're telling me offline that your first uh, Latin music experience was with Hector Labo. Uh, how did right. you how did you meet Hector? He was a, he was very natural. He was very natural. Actually, actually, it's a funny story. That was my second second Latin music experience. Um, Ray Maldonado, who I mentioned earlier, trumpet player, mm -hmm. sent me to sub for him in Ray Barreto's band, <clears throat> and that went really well the first couple of times. And uh, Ray Barreto had uh, he just completed the the album, the Reconstruction record, and he had all these like fusion kind of things. You're familiar with that one? It's probably recorded uh in seven. 78 yeah i wish i had my brother-in-law here with me because he's a, yeah. like a huge into salsa well, and that type of music it's, it's but a clever, I'm, I'm a kind clever of a strange record. puerto rican <laughs> yeah I, I know i i respect <laughs> it but i'm not a, i i'm i haven't heard it that much <laughs> yeah reconstruction it was spelled r-i-c-a-n construction and uh it was very fusion -y elements to it and uh really some cool stuff. And so I did that about two or three weeks. I was subbing for Ray Maldonado and then we both did it together. And then, uh, Ray Barreto was thrilled with the band. And then, uh, then Ray Maldonado, the trumpet player called me up one day. He said, Hey, listen, uh, we can't make the Ray Barreto gig tomorrow. He said, we're going to go with Hector Laveau's band. We're doing that full time. So then, Uh, we went with that. I said, well, what do we do with the Ray Barreto thing? He said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. <laughs> Then I saw Ray Barreto. Ray Barreto didn't speak to me for 10 years after that. <laughs> He was so pissed off, you know, but it was, uh, you know, it eventually worked out, but it took about 10 years to smooth over. But then that's when we went with Hector Laveau's band. And uh, it went really well. Hector was, uh, he was a total natural, total natural. I never heard him warm up. I never heard him sing a scale. I never heard him do anything uh, to do with fundamentals or basics or any kind of maintenance work, or anything like that. And of course, you know, he had his he had his personal thing that he was uh, uh, that was in his way a bit. You know, it was more in his way than on his way sometimes. But um, he, he he had his obstacles that were in his way. But he definitely, I mean, he worked right through that for the most part. And uh, yeah. So yeah, you you were uh, talking a little bit about how you got together with Hector Lavo and and his work ethic, even though with some of the problems that he obviously everyone who knows he had his demons. But uh, so right. yeah, it's very interesting. So so you got together with him and you started playing. You played with him for seven years. So uh, do you have like any memorable stories of playing with him? Well, yeah, yeah, there was there were a lot of memorable stories. A lot of them. Yeah. Uh, one of them in particular was uh, the first time that I went to Colombia. Uh, was uh, we went down there? It was the um, the tour we did of Colombia, right? We went there, and it turned out we were playing. Uh, of course, we didn't know who he was at the time, but it was, it was around 1979, I guess it was, and it ended up we were playing for a New Year's Eve party for Pablo Escobar. And that was a that was a real experience there. That was a really unusual experience, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Well, the good thing is that you're here, so you survived it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 I think I think there was a band there the night before that might not have survived it. <laughs> From what I understand, some of them didn't survive, maybe, but yeah. But uh, or they they were they had a lot of problems or something, but yeah, survived it. There were a lot of, uh, a lot of drama went down, but you know, got through it and it was quite an experience. That's for sure. Awesome. And I also read that you worked on David Bowie's uh, let's dance record, right? Right. Right. Sure did. Yeah. Matter of fact, had a feature number on the uh, title, the title track, let's dance. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, it's funny. I always missed that record because At the time, I was doing some work with Nelson Riddle, who had just produced the uh, Linda Ronstadt thing. It was uh, standard songs, like What's New and things like that. And he was doing work in Houston, Texas. And I was doing like, a, I think it was a New Year's Eve gig with him, a couple of gigs down there with Nelson Riddle. And uh, I stayed a few days extra, hanging out with some friends. And 
you know, in those days, you know, you didn't have, you didn't have your cell phones. You didn't have your email. You didn't have texting. You didn't have any of that. So I checked in with my answering device. That's where you put the thing up to the phone and it goes, oh, beep, and it plays I, I, your I messages. Saw, I saw answering machines. Don't worry about that. I, I'm not that young. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. And uh, anyway, you would put that up to the phone and hear your messages and, There were about eight or nine frantic messages to get back to New York immediately because there was a recording with David Bowie at Power Station. And uh, so I got back and I I made it just in time to, I flew back, made it just in time to not even go home, you know, just come right from the airport, right to the recording studio. And as it turned out, I got to the recording studio a couple of hours too early, but I figured, well, there was no time to go home. So I just went to the studio early and hung out. And then uh, David Bowie had done the same thing. So he came in in, in like a long trench coat and a Panama hat. <laughs> and then uh, we, we sat there and we talked for about an hour before the session started and everything. And it was uh, then uh, after that, it became pretty much a historical record, really, as far as uh, a commercial success for him. And uh, it was uh different direction entirely for him, you know, as far as the commercial success of that record. And uh, there were some really good moments in it here and there, you know, some really good stuff. And, uh, of course, there were some hits in that record, of course, you know. No, of course, yeah. So currently, are, are you uh, currently uh, working with some other bands at the moment, uh, newer stuff? Well, yeah. I'm a, as you know, I'm working on my stuff right now. Um, yeah. work, working on my records and doing my things. Yeah, working a lot of different things. It's uh, mostly um, the bulk of what I'm doing right now is recording with other people. You know, it's like uh, I've been around for quite a while. So there's a large collection of people that do know me and uh, people know of me. And they know they know who I am. They know of my work, some of them. And uh they gave me a call can you record can you do this can you come to the studio and do that so you know that's what i do mostly now i do a few gigs here and there you know as um some shows and concerts uh some clubs here and there and um there's a few bands i play with and some small clubs they're mainly rock and roll bands guys that have been around for a long the original punk era and stuff some of those bands um I still do some gigs from time to time, but it is mostly at this point recording. And I do, I do like being in a recording studio environment. You know, I don't like, uh, I don't like so much bringing the stuff home and doing it in a home no, studio. You know, that's, yeah. that's, that's not that interesting for me to do that because then you're not really, um, you, you're just putting something out there and then just sending it back. And uh, there's no real rapport back and forth between making music from artist to artist. Although I do do that if somebody is like in a geographical location, it's impossible to do otherwise, you know, I, I'll do that. But I go, I go to my friend's house and uh, record with them. You know, there's a couple of, there's one place, the Fox Grove. I'll do that there at Fox Grove in Manhattan. Uh, another place, Allerton studios in the Bronx and uh, different places. Another place in Manhattan once in a while I'll go to, and uh, do some stuff to send it to them. But uh, mostly it's in people's studios, and sometimes people have some really killer studios in their homes, too. Oh, yeah, and, that's like the, the new thing. <laughs> right, yeah. Not as not nearly as much touring. Well, that's a deal, but to. yeah, it's, it's now like a must. Uh, so I also saw that you recently uh, did some work for a band that I'm actually interviewing on the channel. Uh, they're called uh, T-Tan. And you did some work with them as well. Who was that? Uh, a band called T Tan. T H T A N. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Sure. Sure. Great. Great stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. You you're going to be talking to them soon, right? Yes, I will talk to them soon. So yeah, and I'm like, oh, it's so curious that you also uh, did some uh, some trumpet work on on some of their songs on on the album that they have. So yeah, you kept busy, but let's talk about your latest album uh, because I listen, I do, did listen to it. It's already out. It came out on September the 29th. So it's mm -hmm. pretty interesting because it- okay, go, go back to the, uh, oh, uh, something happened there. 
pinch. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, you put it. Yeah, right. there's the uh, picture. Yeah. Yeah, the Thetan, the Thetan record was. Yeah, that was really interesting. That was like. Uh, one of them was like a 17 minute track. And then I had some feature parts in and out of the sequence. And uh, that, that was really cool. That's a very, um, had a very orchestral characteristic to it. It was really, really interesting. Very well done stuff. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. So uh, oh, I did I listen, you, but... yeah, I did listen to, to your new album that's already out on September 29th. And it's, you know, it's hailed as uh, jazz music with Latin influence, but there's also uh, I've, uh, there's a lot of electronic elements. For example, the song Maxo, that song has a lot of like electronics mixed in with the jazz and the trumpet. So uh, when you're working on that on that song, ha, ha, were you thinking because uh, the electronics also play a part, but they don't overtake? Talk to me a little bit about Maxo. Maxo was like. That was um, that. That was really. It was really like a dance, a dance mm -hmm. groove, you know. And it's uh, it was like a dance groove. It started out as like a dance loop sort of thing that we built in the studio, and then, then when I was putting, it, I put down the basic groove, the the percussion, right. Then I ran it through a bunch of filters, several different filters. Uh, one of them was called the culture vulture, which is a really interesting uh, uh, culture vulture. Really, is a really cool thing on its own. But now they have a uh, culture vulture app, you know, the plugin that you can use. Mm -hmm. It sounds amazing too. Then uh, what I did was I'd written some like different variations of different scales that I'd made up. Right, so I placed the scales in there, which gave it like a a bitonal effect at the same time that I did the same thing with the trumpet tracks. So that's why it's like kind of a question answer sort of sound. It's got a very mysterious kind of sound, but very sexy and cool at the same time. Uh, and a club atmosphere at the same time, but also it could be like a movie type sound. And uh, it's got like a, got a real vibe to it. Uh, right now there's uh, somebody there's two different people working on some mixes of it, remixes of it right now. And Colombia and Panama are working on some remixes. And uh, there's been quite a bit of interest in Max Zone and some other places too. Been, people have been talking to me. Seems that's quite a standout, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that was probably. Like for, for parties, yeah. Yeah, it's probably the last. I think it was the last one recorded for that whole thing. Mm hmm. And you worked on this while on lockdown and, and while everything was shut down. How, how was well, the recording no, process? Not, not, not really this record. This record was this record was finished before lockdown. This one before was. lockdown. Okay, right. It was finished and done. Everything completely done before lockdown. Uh, there's another one that we did during lockdown. Grid failure, and uh, with grid failure and myself, that was the uh, the end is the beginning. And then the other one was the um, the uh, cabaret, dismemberment cabaret. And those were both done during lockdown, both of them. Mm -hmm. And But this one was, well, what we're talking about right now was before. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and, so you uh, obviously held, we also, held on to it until now. Yeah. Right. Right, just we kind of kept it on the back burner until now, just put it out, which kind of had a uh, a logical sequence to it, the way it worked out. And, um, and of course, uh, Grid Failure and myself also have another batch of stuff that's uh, just about ready to be finished. You know, there's some things that are almost finished as it is. You know, we've worked on a bulk of material over the past couple of years. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, no, the, the album, you know, uh, for people who like that jazz instrumental stuff and also, uh, you know, the, his, the that Latin music, it's great. But you also do a little bit of like scanting vocals a little bit on like the song Sold Out. Yeah, yeah, Sold Out. There's a lot more. There was quite a bit more scanning that was done on the, the record. Um, the end is the beginning. If you check that record out too, I did quite a bit more scanning on that. Uh, sold out. Yeah, 
sold out definitely had some of that in it i've been doing that for quite some time and i've been um steadily using that in my music you know fairly steadily all throughout my career really a lot of scatting and stuff it's a uh, it's a sound that's new to some people for me there's nothing new about it you know it's it's been around for a long time no, for me i remember and, in the 90s uh there was a song called the scat man yeah yeah <laughs> sure and it was all about that so yeah no it's not it's not a, it's not something new but uh, maybe it's not as mainstream as a lot right. type of, of singing <laughs> i do quite a bit of that too uh with uh there's uh I work a lot also with me and as a tap dancer, Omar Edwards. And uh, we do quite a bit of that. He tap dancer, very advanced stuff. And we, we do a lot of stuff with tracks as a duo. And I do a, quite a bit of scatting on that too, as well as playing the horn. And it's a really interesting sound to scat and to tap together. You know, really cool. Let's get a real conversation, real dialogue going with the music, you know, between the music from the foot, the music from the mouth, you know, and uh, going back and forth and trading back and forth with that, which is a really cool sound. Yeah, and also you ha uh, you have the longest song the, on the record is Bite of the Street, which is like a seven-minute track. Uh, and that was pretty interesting as well. Uh, for, for you uh, working on this album, do you, do you have like a favorite song uh, from this one? Uh, maybe, maybe Bite of the Street maybe by the street because it has it came off as a suite really you know there's so many different mood swings through this thing it's uh it's almost a study in uh in a really cool dreamscape schizophrenia kind of vibe <laughs> so it's it definitely has a thing to it it's really cool like that yeah it really is and it's um i think it might be one of my favorites in a way just because of all the different things it goes through you know, all the different mood swings and, and harmonic shifts. But, but then again, there's another one. Um, well, yeah, I, I would say that might be my all around favorite, all around favorite, very possibly. Yeah. Um, high, high drama also, high drama also. It's, um, some people said that was very filmic, got a, like a movie soundtrack sound to it, which it does. Uh, that could be one as well. That's probably, as far as recording-wise and sonically, that might be the most tightest one, like really tight, totally clean, like just squeaky clean, you know? That might be the best one. Uh, yeah, high I drama, it's, maybe. It's, it's hard to choose uh, because they're all your uh, your babies. So uh, so being a veteran of the, the, the jazz and trumpet scene in New York City, how have you seen jazz evolve during the years and how popular is it now? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go back to uh, one thing I just said, uh, yeah, should sure. mention also that, uh, yeah, that, um, yeah, uh, Bruce, Bruce A. Miller did the mix on that, on this thing. He did a great job. He did a great job on mixing the record. And um, Aiden Perez recording. Dan Grigsby did some of the original recording as well. And uh, so sonically, it came off really well, really did. And those guys did a great job. Um, jazz, as far as popularity, and uh, that's, you know, it's a double-edged thing right there. In some ways, it's never been more popular and never been more popular. And in some ways, it's never been in a worse status. Um never been more popular in the sense that it's all over television. It's all over radio. It's all over like uh, different kinds of like streaming. Uh, it's all over the place right now. People do hear it. It's exposed. You do hear it. There's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, but the downside is the promotional end of it. What's being promoted right now, as far as anything new, is being promoted in a very false and inaccurate way. In other words, you do have some people out there that are trying to rewrite history, uh, like the guys up at Lincoln Center, you got Wynton Marcellus and people like that who are trying to rewrite history to their convenience. 
And uh, that's not, they're trying to make a museum piece out of it. So instead of a living, mm -hmm. breathing thing that it should be, which is what they intended it to be, the creators of jazz intended it to be a living, breathing, evolving thing. They turned it into some kind of a dinosaur in a cage kind of thing where you come to see it there and that's the place to see it. And they've declared that it's a history piece. You got to like uh, do a replica of the old masters. And that's as far as it goes. Nothing happened past 1950s, something, you know. And as a result, you know, a lot of labels now that are signing acts, they're signing, they're signing somebody that sounds uh, what they think is like Billy Holiday sounded or signing somebody that's what they think Ella Fitzgerald sounded. And it's not even close, really. I mean, you know, there was a reason these people sounded the way they sounded. It's what they went through at the time. It's what they were living. It's what they were experiencing. It's how they felt. It's what they were influenced by. They were they were around genius horn players. They were around genius piano players. They were around genius drummers. I have a story for you about that, even uh, about a vocalist. And um, I mean, they were just around geniuses all the time they were doing that. You can't get somebody that's 22 years old and sit there and put them out of there and say they're the new Ella Fitzgerald or this guy is the new uh, Clifford Brown or this or that, you know. That, I mean, what what's the point? That's already been done and it was done right the first time. Plus, you're setting, uh, music. Yeah, I think you're setting uh, setting them up for failure <laughs> when you're like just don't compare. Well, so, yeah. yeah, yeah, you're putting them in a you're putting them in a slot. You're putting mm -hmm. them in a slot right away and said, okay, this is your bracket. I'll never forget there was a, a uh, there was an old lady when I first came to New York and uh, she was a singer in a a bar downtown, an Arthur's Tavern. Uh, her name was Laurel Watson, right? And she sang and played brushes with drums, you know, and sang played brushes with drums. I told her several times, your brushes like that. And she just joked, get out of here. I don't want to talk about that. You know, she was joking. She just started laughing. I said, your brush work is impeccable, right? And her singing was really good, too. You know, said, get out of here. She just joking around. So finally, I'm sitting around listening to cable radio one time, and it was the uh, it was the Gene Krupa Orchestra featuring Laura Watson. Then I realized, okay, she was with the Gene Krupa Orchestra for two or three years and featured vocalists. That's where she learned how to do that. You know, Gene Krupa had showed her how to do brushwork. But you know, imagine, I mean, that that was like two or three years on the road with Gene Krupa. I'm sure he showed her how to do that, and and that's what it takes is like learning from these people. And the experience, why they did it, how they did it, living it, living it. You just don't come right out of the box. So where, where can people uh, who want to see you playing the trumpet catch you? Because I know you play all around New York City. Like, uh, where, when are your next gigs so people can go watch you play? Yeah. Well, um, like I said, most of my stuff's in the studio. Now, um, mm -hmm. I'm doing... I'm going to be doing the Hispanic Mechanics again on December 8th. Okay. December 8th. And, and that's um, that's at the Parkside Lounge. Parkside Lounge. That's in New York on uh, Houston Street. And uh, that'll be the next one for that. Uh, I got a couple of them coming up. Omar Edwards and myself. That's uh, up around... Um, this weekend up around Nyack. Uh, let's see. I'll, I'll post something on Facebook about that. Yeah. Okay. And then there's uh, a couple other things in between. There's a, there's a gig out in Brooklyn. Um, mostly, mostly it's in the studio right now, but the next one with Hispanic mechanics will be December 8th as of now, unless something comes up before then, but I'll try to post it on social media if it does. Awesome. So people can, can catch you playing live. So, uh, Mac, you know, it's been great talking to you about, obviously, the, all the uh, amazing artists that you collaborated with and talk, talking about uh, the how jazz has morphed into the years and everything's been 
pretty interesting. So anything that you'd like to say to the people watching this before we go? Uh, yeah, yeah. Just keep listening. Keep listening to the music you love. Keep going out to see it. Make an effort. Make an effort to go see it because uh, that's really important is to get people in the clubs to see the music because the clubs now longer, they no longer support the music, really. They just um, they just open the door. They open the door. They don't promote. They don't push anything at all. They they don't do anything. They just basically open it up. And it's, it's up to the artists now to bring the people to the clubs. Uh, there are very few places that have a built-in audience here. I don't know. Is it like that in PR also now? Or Yeah, there, there's like smaller clubs, but uh, uh, I know there's some piano bars, places where people play jazz, like, and it's like a restaurant uh, setting. And I think there's one here in Old San Juan that I've been told that the owner uh, used to play in albums of people, but I don't know his name, and he plays the piano and stuff. Uh, in his restaurant so it's pretty cool uh but yeah but mostly uh here uh not so much <laughs> but yeah uh yeah i, I, yeah, I hear you yeah. yeah yeah there is there is the restaurant scene here in new york i mean i i did that for years and i i, I just grew completely frustrated with that i i didn't like that at all i i did it for years at, at some of the supper clubs here and i just i didn't like that vibe you know it was just like uh, you're sitting there, you're playing, and then uh, people are eating, they're on the cell yeah. phones, and it's like... I think, if you think about it, I recently saw that movie La La Land, uh, uh -huh. and there's a scene where he's, like, playing, uh, and he, he, the exact same thing, he, he, they're like, they, they told him, just play Christmas music, and then he did, like, uh, like uh, his own original, and then they threw him out. So, yeah, yeah, and, right. because, he was <laughs> yeah because he was frustrated of, like, playing to people who are eating and not paying attention. And obviously that movie is, is supposed to be set. set uh, uh, I think it's, I, I saw it, but uh, but uh, yeah, it's, there's a little bit of, it's like a, they have, they talk a lot about jazz, but I can't remember right now if the movie is set up in the past or in the present day. I can't remember right now, but yeah. Uh, something like what you were describing, like playing and people eating with their phones and you're like, no one's paying attention to what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah and he, and even and even crazier than that i mean back in uh 2011 i was playing one of the prominent supper clubs and then the uh the manager of the club came up to me as i'm playing up up on this elevated area he came up and says can you guys hold it down because table seven can't hear table four on their cell phones they were their conversation was going on, on their cell phones between two different tables in the club it's like and you know that's a, I don't you know that didn't interest me at all either. So you you want to make a little bit more serious presentation than that. But uh, yeah, yeah. So the restaurant, the restaurant supper club vibe. There's and, and there are a couple of those right now, and uh, there are a couple of them in New York. But you have to. It's like a membership sort of thing. Mm. Like they charge a thousand dollars for the membership to get in. You got to have a thousand dollars membership card to get into the place, and then. Uh, they go, they come in to hear you then, but there's, there's a few of those going on. It's like, uh, well, that that might be a little bit more different. That might be a little more exclusive. But uh, I, bet. Yeah. I don't think I don't think that music should ever be like really exclusive. You know, it, not like that. It shouldn't be exclusive. It should be inclusive. And that's that's where music got in trouble to start with was being exclusive. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I agree. So I'm gonna post the link for people who haven't heard uh, the album. Uh, if they want to get it, stream it everywhere. It's out now. It's out September the 28th. And here's the uh, Matt Gollahan and the Hispanic Mechanics Bite of the Street. And I love this artwork because I I like the the flowers that you did on the background. Plus you have that that cool leather jacket. So yeah, uh, I'll post it so people can get it. So. Uh, Mac, again, thank you for taking time of your morning to to chat with me. So uh, until next time, people, this is Hector, the shield dude on a couch, and I'll see you all right here on the couch. Thank you and good night. Great.